if you're standing up here, you get to take your mask off for just a couple of minutes. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I know it's a little scary to go out. These is Karen Christensen, and she's going to be uh, showing you uh, some images of Tacoma Little Theater, uh, which creates quality live theater experiences, embracing professional standards of excellence and utilizing the perform performing arts as a means of building community. Karen has been the office manager of Tacoma Little Theater since October of 2015. No stranger to the arts in Tacoma, Karen is a talented actor, director, and musician. In addition to her duties as Tacoma Little Theater's office manager, Karen serves as the director of the Murder Mystery Series and has been seen on the Tacoma Little Theater stage, most recently in Jesus Christ Superstar. I think I saw that. That's a fabulous thing. Uh, Karen, do you want to come up and start your show? Sure. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I hope I can see these that well. Okay. So, um, just we we've been busy. Uh, when COVID hit, well, even before COVID hit, the plan at TLT was to completely gut the auditorium and put in new seats. All the new seats were bought. Um, all the money was in place from grants and great people. And Can people understand her? Yeah. I'm an actor. <laughs> but there, I'll do that. <laughs> um, I forgot, I'm so used to wearing it. Uh, so, so this is what we've been doing. The... We've had, the kids were, excuse me, we have two summer programs that we do in the summertime and on 210 North I Street. This um, used to be a, a, either a garage where they repaired and took care of cars. And uh, that's from 1950 or so. This is supposed to work, right? There we go. And just some old shows. I forget what that one was called. It, it's there somewhere. Um, but some old, some old pictures of how small the stage was back then. And before we did this, we were at the Slovenian Hall in Old Town for a long time. Just an old picture of the, what the lobby used to look like. Uh, notice the lady up there with the cigar, cigarette in her hand. Um, and this is uh, one of my murder mysteries. We do it on, have been doing them down at the social, down on the water. They're silly fun. It's a four-course meal that you get to choose from. You go there and you order your food, and everybody goes away happy and full. We do them, we've been doing them three times a year. This year, probably only two, maybe one. Okay, so that's that. Um, oh, oh. This is uh, from um, Dracula, a couple years ago. This is Macbeth. I'm not in the theater, so I can say it. This is uh, The Pillow Man which went to nationals and won awards for best director, best set, uh, best supporting actor, best um, uh, cast. So it's a national award. So we are now the oldest nationally, uh, nationally awarded, award-winning community theater in Washington. There we go. Okay, I'm clicking. It doesn't like me. There we go. These are our award winners. This is the cast that went. Uh, Blake on the end is the director and the set designer. This is Scrooge, the musical, a couple years ago. This is A Doll's House. This is um, Evil Dead, the musical. Oh, it was a bloody mess. This is a show we did called The Shattering. It was an AAC, American Association of Community Theater show that we did. And this is a chorus line, which we had to close with on, uh, that we only got to do the one weekend of it uh, when we had to stop. But it's coming back for a four week run this year, this season. And it's an awesome, oh, that was such a good show. And will be again. 
This is our, some of our kids' programs. I believe this is Wizard of Oz, duh. Um, we do them all year round. In the summertime, we do four week runs. It's an all day thing. This is an after school program. This is, we also do a club TLT, which is for the teenagers. And that runs all year long do, too, and they do a couple of shows. Okay, for our season coming up, uh, this is Terms of Endearment. We open that on September 10th. And then we go into Clue on stage. This is based off the, uh, the movie. So you have all the same characters and the same quirks. It's going to be really fun. All together now is um, Tacoma Musical Playhouse and us. It's a whole bunch of really awesome music from a whole bunch of different shows. Wizard of Oz is our Christmas show. Chorus Line, of course, like I said, it's coming back in March. A Luck of the Irish is a new show. That, uh, that closes our season. So, just so you know, that's what the front of our theater looks like now. Okay? So they're not in order. Okay, here we go. Now we start the remodel. Everything was stripped down to the floor. The floor was evened out. We got rid of that side door by the bus, bus stop over there, so we didn't have to have it. The wood, oh, they came in and uh, we were able to reuse the wood. It had to be certified, but that wood was probably 60, 70 years old. We got to reuse most of it. It saved like $5,000 worth of lumber. More of it getting ready to be built. This is the rake that we were getting. More of the rake. See how it slopes up? The seats are all offset, so no one sits in front of you. We did lose 42 seats, but we don't care because everybody can see really well. And see, that's the rake all being done before the plywood goes on top. It's so cool. <laughs> we uh, tore down the, um, the booth, the tech booth, and rebuilt it from scratch. And now it's got two box or two doors that come down that the spotlights will go on when we have to use spotlights so they won't be in the, in the house anymore. They'll be just strictly up there and controlled. More of the rake. This is, it's all covered with plywood now. So now you can't even, this is the, it's all covered waiting for the seats to go in. That's the booth on the right. Here it is. This is the beginning. This is where the seats start coming in. That's the, that's the seats are in. It's so beautiful. Cup holders, they hold popcorn tubs. Just in the lobby. The lobby got an, up, uh, an upgrade, too. Uh, you notice the ramp on the side? We are now, we, had, we were ADA before, but now the ramp is there, make it even easier. We got rid of the door on the side. The lobby got a whole new facelift. Uh, all new paint, new carpet. The carpet are carpet squares made out of uh, recycled tires and they can be pulled out if needed and replaced. This is, the, this is before the outside. It's another one of, this is starting of the, the new, and it's very retro. Did I, okay, that's back to the beginning. I lost some pictures. Well, that's where I wanted it to end anyway, but that's not quite what I wanted. But that's, that's the old, not the, not the old. See, that didn't show up either. That's weird. Okay, so there's that. And the paint, we, the whole front's painted again, and it's very much what it was in the 50s and the 60s when it was redone. And again, that's my favorite picture. Lights up all by itself at night. And I have uh, uh, brochures if anybody wants them. And that's all I've got, I think. So... We had real, we had our grants that we had, that we got the PPP loans, we got both of those. Um, uh, we were, all but two of us were furloughed for a couple of mo months, oh goodness, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, and then we came back in June, I think, and started working. Um, it, d grants and, and we just managed to do it. Good, lots of good people donating money. Um, would call us and say, take my season tickets and put it towards, the, towards, the, towards you guys, and then we'll just buy new ones when it comes. Oh, one other thing that I, was my project when I came back, if you go to our website, 
and you go on the top banner, and you see um, under, I forget where it is, but you draw, it's a drop down, and you go to programs. I scanned every program we could find and matched them up to the shows. So if you go on and you click on most of those years and then the shows, you'll be able to see the whole program that has been scanned in. It's kind of cool to, yeah, it's kind of, I was, I had a fun time doing it. <laughs> so, yeah, and of course we, got now, we now have the SVOG grant, so that helps as well. So, yeah, we've done a lot of work. And we have a new sound system that's come in, so we shouldn't have any issues. We uh, don't have the upper lobby anymore, so if you walk, you walk in through the curtain and you're in the theater, um, we have a, we, a, new, a new hearing system. Uh, we have, again, a sound system's almost ready to finish be going in, so that'll be done by the time we open. So. Any more questions? Yeah, I'm right here. Yeah. I can't see anything. Yes? <laughs> and um, I remember getting Gordon Almond's retreat <laughs> and intermission mm -hmm. that I felt so special going to your theater and yeah. listening to my singing. Oh, neat. Theater. Neat. Well, we, um, Good memories. Yeah. And the new seats are super comfortable. They're either, I think they're eight inches deep, the, the cushions on the butts, under your butt's going to be <laughs> comfy. Yeah. Um, yeah, we can't wait to have people in and enjoy a show. September 10th. Great. Thanks, Karen. Oh, you're welcome. <coughs> Again, brochures are here. If anyone has anything. <coughs> Karen, let's put these brochures back on the table because people are more likely yeah. to pass them and remember. So our next star is Sharon Steyer, and I think a lot of you know Sharon. She's done shows here at Tripod before. Um, in the past, there were shows on photographs, and uh, she's known for having really good titles and her sense of humor. So she's, uh, so I might as well read what she wrote. Uh, Just as a fluke, Sharon began making collages in the fall of 2017 with the goal of reusing the hundreds of photographs she has taken. Uh, flash forward to today where Sharon's collages are always available for viewing and sale at the Proctor Art Gallery. All of her collages are assembled using scissors, glue, art books, magazines, and anything else that captures her attention. After you see her talk, when you look at a magazine, you're going to see some images and go, oh, I'm going to cut that out for Sharon. <laughs> and she probably has, you know, a foot-high stack of images already. Sharon? Well, hello everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Lynn, for inviting me again. So yeah, so in 2017, I started, I switched from photography to collage. Um, and so I did a show here before, so I'm just kind of picking up from these. So these start in 2019. And so I do have a stack of a lot of photographs, and on this one, it's like I had this one piece here was this model with this great grimace that she had. So I knew I wanted to do something with this. So, you know, Leonardo da Vinci portrait, and then this is from a magazine, this hair, I added tons of hair. And the title of this one is, I read your diary, and I've got some suggestions. <laughs> Okay, so I'm advancing. Eric? There we go. Thank you. 
Um, so this one is called, I am not being too critical. Um, again, so I, again, this is an old art magazine of a Madonna. And then I found this great picture with a woman with the red hair, and I like that. And then this, but it needed some intensity. And so I found this image of Rose um, McG McGovern, who's part of that uh, Me Too, it's a very intense woman. So I kind of added this, and so I am not being too critical. And so, um, who knows? <laughs> So I have this really cool architectural um, book that is from Japan. So it just had this tele telepathy telephone, which I thought was really very funny. Mm -hmm. And then um, the artist Gerhard Richter was just sitting up very straight with his dog, and I knew I wanted to use that. And then, of course, Nurse Ratchet with this <laughs> great hair that they did was just so great. Then, you know, it just went on. <laughs> it just went on and on and on. And, so this one is called, Do the Sins of Our Past Come Back to Haunt Us? And so on we go. So again, I found this uh, in an art book, and I just thought she was really very funny. And so then I found a pool to put her in, and then a little guy to fish, and then some minnows. And it happened, and this one is called, It's Just the Hundreds of Little Things That Add Up. And that was a phrase my mom used to say. She had seven kids, so she just used to say that all the time. So it's owed to my mom. Um, oops, jumped ahead. Let's go backwards. Nope, lightly touch. Um, this one is a British explorer, Henry Woolsey. Um, in um, 19, or no, in 2016, he walked alone 970 miles in his attempt to reach the South Pole. He was 30 miles from the South Pole when he realized he wasn't going to make it. So he took this self-portrait, and it was published in The New Yorker, and it was just so great. I mean, the cigar, the missing teeth. He's called it, he goes, my journey has come to an end. And so I embroidered it. I just love his face. Um, and then another embroidery piece. Um, I took a Degas nude, and then um, architectural, you know, beautiful patio somebody gets to have, and then embroidered the hair, and then embroidered with gold thread. So it's very shiny. This really is luminous. So it's all little leaves and shininess in here. And this one is called On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous. Um, this one is fun. I used to work at University of Puget Sound, and this one student convinced so many of the women students to do uh, um, just nude shots all around the campus. Some of them are quite wild. And this one is the UPS women's swim team, and they were all lined up on the pool. So I cut them out and gave them the Grand Canyon. <laughs> So this one is Sisterhood is Powerful. What was the title again? Sisterhood is Powerful. I just sold this to a woman who was on the UPS. She was on the synchronized swim team. She's like my age. It's so sweet. It went to a right home. Um, this one um, is called If My Devils Were to Leave Me, I Fear My Angels Would Flee As Well. And it's a, I just found this image of this woman here. I just thought that, that was just a striking image to me. And so then I was kind of working with the George O'Keefe flower book, and then I just wanted to make that synchronicity happen. I thought that one was really pretty. Um, here's another Georgia. Um, this one is called Say My Name. So I was just playing around with Georgia images, and I thought it would be interesting to just have a face coming out behind. And I have this collection of um, um, black faces, and they're just so strong, and it just worked behind there to me. So it's, just, it's a very simple collage, but I like that one. 
Um, this one is a box. Sometimes I'll do boxes. Um, so this image, which is not really showing up so clearly, but um, Maya Lin, who's the architect who did the Vietnam Memorial, she got um, an art grant to do like 10 sites along Columbia Gorge. And so this is one of the sites. It's this enormous tree stump that she put in. And so oh, you can't see it all. It's always interesting to see how things show, show up on slides. But um, I put faces. I, I was experimenting with weaving. So I wove faces into the background. Can you tell us? We can see them. You can. You can. It's hard to see these back here. I tried a different way, just a, uh, just a horizontal weave. But this one is the, these have the full weave. So it's a little tricky to get the pictures to really line up and hold true. And then I just kept going. It just became the Karens and the candles. And then I did a plaque. And it's called, um, Despite Everything, There Are Still Moments of Joy. And then um, my son Miles has become quite a gardener. And so we have tons of plants. So this one just. It's called, I Can't Stop Gardening. <laughs> oh, it was just pretty, just experimenting, cutting out things. Um, this one is the origami gardener. Um, I had this image for a while, just of this farmer in the foreground and his tractor. I just really, I liked it. And then I added the ocean. And then I just thought, what? And then it became all these origami, even origami carrots. Um, <laughs> and then, hey, I'm running late. If I'm not there soon, order without me. So this was um, a photograph. It was a black and white photograph that I got while I was in England. And it was on like the, one of the front pages. It was a very famous newspaper photographer. And this was a story like behind this woman is this very grumpy, frumpy woman who's all upset that all these weeds have grown in her yard. And of course, they're pot. So, <laughs> so it's just, I don't know, just a whimsical, whimsical one. And then um, I'm a member of Puget Sound Book Artist, and during COVID, they had this really fun project. It was called Staying Home. And what we did is divided into groups of six artists, and everybody made like a six by four booklet that had six pages in it. And then we passed it all around and from the mail. We mailed it to each other, and then it slowly came back to us. So it was a really nice keepsake. So that's my cover, Kensington Palace. And then this one is like, I've told you all I know. And this is right here. I've had this image of this guy for a while. And it, this is Eric Jensen. He's head of Greenland's self-rule government now. So he's really moved up in the ranks since I found this photo. That's what I mean. They'll sometimes cling. I don't know. It just was, I just liked it. So it ended up in this one. Um, this one, she, is, um, she was smart enough to want more, but tired enough to accept the way things were. <laughs> so beautiful dress. I just thought she was dressed perfectly. Um, this one is, we've seen better days. This one is called social distancing. This one is called A Sleight of Hand and Twist of Fate, U2 Lyric. Um, this started off as a leaf. This is just a leaf image. And then I had these like, kind of old athletic illustrations. And then I found this four-handed juggler. And then I glued on googly eyes. <laughs> so it can come from like nothing, from just a leaf image. Something can just slowly happen. Um, this one is, um, how long should a person wait for something to feel good again? I know, kind of ominous, but I loved her face. I loved her face, and I needed to find something. His face took a while to find. And I had this great, I like old motels quite a bit, so it was a motel image. 
And then this one is, there's just so much going on right now. And then continuing in the COVID theme, because that's what I was doing. These were done all through 2020. This one is COVID day number 254. No matter how much we protect ourselves, we're still vulnerable. And this one, again, I was weaving. So this is a lion's face that I wove into the chest area. So it's just showing permeability. This one is COVID day 375, first haircut in 420 days. <laughs> so again, <laughs> we tried with our hair. Um, this one is uh, COVID day number 195. I'm fine. <laughs> this is just an eyeball. I just found this eyeball for, you know, like really heavy duty mascara. I don't know why it was so bloodshot, but I loved it. Um, let's see, this one is COVID day 297. I'm learning to coexist and it's going really, really well. So I have these Tashin books that I'm just stuck on that have these great faces of animals that they all have these kind of eerie but almost human qualities to them. Love that. Trump was still around the old Time Magazine, time to go. Okay, and then here, boy, that's really washed out, sorry. Um, I joined the Proctor Gallery at this time, and so Proctor Gallery has uh, theme walls, and they have often a Mount Rainier wall. And so this photo is not as washed out in reality, but I took this photo of Rainier, and then I just started adding moons, and then I did this collage. So this is a summertime one of it, and it's called many, many, many moons ago on old Mount Rainier. This is a series. Oops, I hit the wrong one. Here we go. So this one is called, the again, sorry, The Last Golden Days of Autumn on Mount Rainier. And then, let me adjust all my little things here. And then this one is A Cold Winter's Night on Mount Rainier. So um, I sell, I make coasters of a lot of these pieces and they are for sale at Proctor Gallery. And someone just asked me for a set of these and the fourth one I did is a UFO. <laughs> so I didn't show it because I'm not so sure about it, but anyhow, Mount Rainier series. Um, sometimes I do cards, this was at Christmas time. So it was like, there's talk, Mary. Your child looks like you, but Joseph? Not so much. <laughs> Just whatever. <laughs> Here's another one. I thought this one was funny. It goes, uh, want to watch me go over and freak out that photographer? <laughs> this one is, um, where are we? Um, we only know what we can remember. Uh, Easter, my work here is done. <laughs> okay, now we're back to big collages here. This one is, do I wake up each day determined to be the best me that I can possibly be? Absolutely not. I just love this. This is a carved wooden face by a Japanese artist. It's just amazing. <laughs> Um, this one is, I used to be indecisive, but now I'm not so sure. <laughs> That's a quote from Winston Churchill. I thought that was funny. Um, this, the background on this, is an overview of a log jam in the river. And then this face is from like a 1930s Harper Bazaar before they did photography in them. They used to do pen and ink, which is kind of worked. This one is, um, what she really wanted was to just stop worrying. 
Don't we all? This is from an environmental calendar that I had. I just loved it because it's this big deal bridge over this little tiny creek. Like, just what we do with problems. We make these big structures over these little things. Here we go. I just, you know, this is a very traditional collage thing to do a big cat in the background. So this one is what? Have I become your little plaything? We go a little more serious one. If you had one opportunity to seize everything you've ever wanted, would you take it or walk away? I just wanted to try gradations. So this is like Portland seascapes. This was a fence, just in a black and white photography showing contrast. This is a girdle ad from a magazine and some birds. This one is, um, perhaps we are fated to live when and where we do, surrounded by our secret heroes and villains. This one is part of this new series that I've been working on, and I just like getting like 17th century portraiture and then playing around with it. And this is part of that, goes on, to find out who rules over you, simply find out who you are not allowed to criticize. Here we go. Um, some memories you never want to let go of. And here, of course, the four eyes, fun. And then I have been pressing flowers from my garden, so I've been adding pressed flowers. And then this is an old portraiture, you know, just a little girl in her garden. This one is called the music lesson. I love how this just fit on her neck, just on her head. And they just are eye to eye. This little card says, um, if you can't sing, then whistle. <laughs> Let me turn this over here. I'm almost done. Here we go. This is Mary, Queen of Sloth. <laughs> this is another image that I've had for a long time. This is the drag queen RuPaul, and he's just, and Annie Leibovitz took his photo for Vanity Fair a while ago, and I, I just saw it. That is a majestic dress that is so well worn. So I kept it for a while, and then I gave my husband a sloth calendar, and we just absolutely fell in love with these sloth smiles. And then these are, I look for crown jewels. So I found an image of crown jewels, and then the background is a Leonardo da Vinci, Birth of the Magi. Just kind of worked well. And then this one is, when you finally learn that pleasing the world is impossible, you begin to please yourself. And so again, an old, you know, portrait, paint, this is a painting rather, with this headdress, and the coloring just worked with this goat. So I added flowers to kind of fit it in, and this is a pressed honeysuckle, and kind of extended this over into the mat. This one is, um, I have absolutely no interest in trying to fit in. <laughs> and this is Renoir. And then I used a lot of pastels to kind of blend this in so it would work well. And then I added a lot of pressed flowers from my garden on that. And then this one is a frantic effort to appear fine. I'm fine. I am just fine. And so um, this is, again, an 18th century portrait, which were very low on the bosoms. And then uh, I added a steampunk girl to it. And I went down to Tinkertopia. And there were my little place to go where I can find stuff to add. So I have little crystals that I added. And again, a flower from my garden. 
And then this one is, um, I've decided that it was time that I got my own pets. So again, another 17th century portraiture. Again, I slide a little sloth baby in there, out of flowers, a giraffe, an anteater, an ants. Just like to blend it all in. And then this one is, if you think you can earn my forgiveness by bringing me snacks, well, you are absolutely correct. <laughs> so these are, she's got snacks, bugs flying around, and then a lot of beads and Google eyes. She has a googly eye, and then she's got googly eyes all through her dress. It's very fancy. Um, I was lo looking for a while. I couldn't find a bird head. You know, I knew she was a bird. I got that, and I got this, and I got this, but I couldn't get a head. And then I saw the writer, Amy Tan, is doing drawings of birds. And so this is a, one of Amy Tan's bird heads that just kind of worked on this. And then this is my last one. This says, rest, dear souls. Tomorrow we get to try again. I like, she's got eyes, you know, it's kind of a Matisse face, and then I put eyes in there. And the kitty, of course. And that's it. Thank you. Yes? What are you using to cut out things with? Um, I have a small scissors, and I have an X-Acto knife. Those are the two things I mostly use. And then I have all kinds of glues. I have all, I have just an array of glues. If I'm sticking heavy things on, I have heavier glues. I have certain kinds of glue sticks that work really well. And then I've got just PVA glues so they won't wrinkle. I have just a real selection of glues that I use. Elaine. Uh, did you paint on that at all? I did not. I didn't, the color was just really great on that one. Um, and then I did, I went into that Tashin book again. I'm just, I have to stop it, but I just love these weird faces that are over there. Somebody thought they were rats, but these are not rats. They have like this long, it's like a deer. But you see these faces and they're eating things. And then they have these pretty plants and I don't know, I like it. This guy, this guy, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, the cat, yeah, photobombing. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Mark, hi. Hi. Of the Georgia O'Keeffe and the black face underneath, could I see a drop shadow? Is one layer of paper a little higher than the other? You're very good, yeah. That, I took that photo um, before I had glued it in. Um, and then I put the whole thing together and I never ended up getting another shot of it. And then it sold. And so I'm ending up, you're exactly right, it's got a shadow to it. But that, it ultimately was glued into the back, so it didn't have that shadow. Good eye, Mark. <laughs> um, yes? When you say that you weave work with, uh -huh. what are you using to weave? Um, I'm using another image. You know, and so like I wanted to find for that permeable, I wanted to find something heartfelt for her, but also vulnerable for it. So I was looking around. Um, actually, I just went through a Vogue magazine for that because I was trying to find a flesh tone that would go. And this is really embarrassing, but I used uh, Justin Bieber <laughs> has a tattoo of a lion on his chest, and so that's what I use. So I just cut those apart. I just do them in length and then in horizontal, and I just keep them together. I tape them, and then I cut into the picture, and then I just slowly weave it and keep sliding it till I can get the image to stay true underneath it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Duncan, hi. Yeah, that can happen. Um, what I like with the cat, the cat was on a much larger and it was on the other side. So I have a scanner. So I could put the image in the scanner 
and then put it into Photoshop and then flip the image and then size it to what I want. So I do that. I can play with that. So I have just this little operation on my desk where I can switch through things. But I keep pretty, I, I stay pretty true to the original image, but I'll, I will mess with it so it feels real. I like it to have a real story line to it. Thank you. What size is the finished product? Um, they vary. Like, um, God, what is this one? I think this one framed comes to like 16 by 20 on that. Sometimes they're 8 by 10 if they're coming out of like some of the older art books. They'll just be 8 by 10 within that. Um, sometimes that's when I'll scan them and enlarge them. Um, but I would think um, 11 by 14 is another size for the images that's very common. Um, I um, use frames. These are all matted and framed, ultimately. So um, my process is I get the image made. I have gone to Goodwill and thrift stores, and I have a selection of frames at my home. And so I've been very lucky. I've been matching them up really well, and I've gotten good at repairing and cleaning up frames. And then I mat them, so the matting is in there next. And along the journey comes the title. I um, have always collected lines from anything I read, books or whatever, and so I have a big notebook. And so I normally don't name them till after. So I just kind of go through my book and kind of see what's hitting a chord to me. I just see you keeping each one of those up yourself. They're so cool. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, well, a few of them I made up, but most of them are from my book, from something I've read. So, yes. Well, I bought a print of Yes. 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 And I was amazed at the quality of the print. So I'd like to know. Oh, thank you for asking. Thank you for asking. Yeah, so um, as I said, all my work is at all my original, well, the originals that I have available are at Proctor Art Gallery. Um, I also can do prints of any of them. So what I'm doing right now is I, I'm set up for like mats and backing board for 8 by 10s which are a pretty nice size, actually. It's surprising. It sounds small, but it's a pretty good size. And I have a good printer at home. So again, that's when my scanner will come in. I'll scan it so I get that good color tone. And then I send them over, and I can work on them on Photoshop if I see. Actually, a lot of times the prints are correct some of my errors on the originals. And then I have them. I, can, I have mats and backing boards and all of that. So again, any of those, any of the things you see. Or, and I do have a website, and I am way behind in updating it, way behind. So if you can have patience, I have my cards here if you want to contact me. So you can look at my website, but it's really behind. But you can also contact me if you're interested in anything. Um, I do greeting cards. They're really fun. They're surprisingly really good. Um, and they're for sale at Proctor. And then I've been doing coasters. So, and they're really fun, too. They're just sweet. So yay. Yeah, thank you, Lynn. So I'll keep some cards here if anybody wants any. I'll step down. Oh, I'll put cards on the back table, I bet. I think people are more inclined to pick them up than I yeah. think. Again, it's not voting for a guest, it's just putting it on the ballot. Get it developed. 
make sure we have access to health care for all of us. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oops, I guess I can take this off. Um, so next are uh, Steph Farber and his wife Phyllis Harrison. And they've been working for all of us in the community for 25 or 30 years. I'm going to read what they uh, gave us. Uh, Steph has spent most of us waking hours on Broadway between South 9th and South 13th first pushing brooms and creating machine-made bows in his parents' jewelry store. That would be Leroy's Jewelers. Then ultimately, as a custom jeweler and three-time recipient of one of the jewelry industry's most prestigious design awards, the American Gem Trade Association's Spectrum Award. He, along with the late Babe Lear, served on the Pantages Center Broadway Center board for 22 years, becoming one of the reasons the BCPA instituted term limits for board members. <laughs> Steph served also on the Theater District Association Task Force from the beginning as it built the theater on the square brought the Rialto to the theater district and restored it to open the very day Seattle took down its historic theater. I don't remember the name of that theater. Does anybody here know it? A musical. A musical theater. It's called the musical. Okay. Okay. Um, and yes, Steph was on the first night board raising money and hosting workers and patrons for a zillion years, um, and uh, hosted a party at Leroy's on that night for everybody. Um, and by the way, they're both uh, Tacoma natives. Phyllis, after migrating to other parts of the country for some years, returned to Tacoma in 1988 with a PhD in folklore and along with boat builder Mike Blakovich, rescued a warehouse on the Thea Foss and launched what is now the Foss Waterway Seaport, believe it or not. She joined the Broadway Center staff in the early 1990s, just a week or so before the opening of the Rialto. Phyllis brought members of various cultural communities together to influence the creation of the mask sculptures on Broadway. And you walk along Broadway, and they're at about shoulder height. I believe they're made by Doug Granham. Yes. Is that right? Um, and somewhere between the Pantages and the Rialto, these two met and got married. Mm -hmm. How long have you guys been married now? It seems like only yesterday. <laughs> oh, wow. wow. OK, <laughs> come on up. Oh, it's you. Oh, it's you. Yeah. So we um, do not have formally written out um, remarks, but what we did want to talk about this evening was what's happening currently with the um, contractor management of the theaters, uh, the Rialto, the Pantages, the Theater on the Square, the really heart of, of downtown Tacoma and, and, the, and the theater district right now. Um, so... We know, so we, we are speaking personally from our own experience and our own hearts. We are not spokespeople for anybody in particular. We know what we know. We know what we are concerned about. Most of what we know is public, if you kind of know the right place to, to, uh, to look for it. Um, one of our concerns is what we don't know. Uh, and for those of you who are not aware, um, and Steph will be talking more about this in a little bit, but for those of you who are not aware, the contract for managing 
uh, the historic downtown theaters and the theater on the square, um, has been uh, under review, as happens regularly, uh, and RFP has been put out by the city, and the ultimate winner of the contract for management is a global corporation out of Los Angeles, a for-profit corporation. And we have um, a, a number of concerns on a couple of different levels. So, Mr. Farber? Oh, so one of our first projects uh, uh, when, we, when we met, Steph on the board and, and me on the, uh, on the staff, was to put together a souvenir program for the 10th anniversary of the restoration of the Pantages. It was the 75th anniversary of the theaters, and it was also an anniversary of TLT, but I don't remember which one. At any rate, um, having survived that, that process without killing one another, we decided we were definitely a team. But one of the um, great pleasures in that was interviewing Murray Morgan about theaters in downtown Tacoma. And his first comment to us, and the first comment, the first statement in our souvenir program was that there were theaters in downtown Tacoma before the stumps were pulled out of Pacific Avenue. So theater has always, always, always been an enormous presence in our downtown. Um, always, and still is. Which brings us to, um, to the early, to the mid-1970s. You? Okay. Okay. Can we swap? Yeah. Okay. I'll give you my jacket. <laughs> we can do this. Okay. All right. Um, this better? Okay. Um, in the mid '70s, um, a group of a group of women who I've always called the Seven Women with Brooms were got tired of seeing the Seattle Symphony playing in a high school auditorium. And they said, you know, we need a place in Tacoma where real live performances can happen. And one of them, a woman by the name of Virginia Shackelford, said, I know of a place that used to be a great performing arts uh, house. Uh, it's now called the Roxy Movie, Th the Roxy Theater. People remember the Roxy? Okay. The Roxy, by the way, had um, at least a full year of, of Star Wars, the first Star Wars that played there. Um, so you can tell it had fallen on a little bit of disuse by that time. Um, Virginia Shackelford was, if I may, just as an aside, was probably as right-wing a politician or, or a, a right-winger as you could imagine. And she teamed up with, among others, Josephine Hyman, who was probably the most pinko lefty you ever found. And the two of them, who never agreed on anything, agreed to work together to turn that Roxy Theater into a performing arts hall. Um, and they did. Um, these, they, along with the rest of the five women with brooms, cleared off the first few rows of the, Panti of the Roxy Theater. They used brooms, they used um, they used detergents, they cleaned the seats, they must have used um, uh, uh, special tools to get decades of gum from the undersides of each of those seats. And they cleaned, it, cleaned them up enough so that they could invite people, uh, invite movers and shakers in the city to come down and to hear their, their vision for this, for this hall. That look, we can turn this old movie theater into something wonderful. Well, Phil Schroeder was a city council member at the time, and others joined with them. And together, shortening this um, years-long <laughs> episode, together they created a community, the, the community, the grassroots community, along with the city of Tacoma, and help from federal government and state government, turned it into the Pantages Center, the first public-private partnership of its kind in the country, and a model that was used all over the country afterwards for people who had disused theaters and didn't know how to make them work again. We were the model, we were the first, and it worked wonderfully. And it started with the, from the very grassroots of, of, of our community. Um, it was seven individuals who got together and made a huge difference 
and it's been continued with grassroots support ever since. Ever since. For, for 43 years. 43 years that it's been in existence for another decade before that for them to work on it. Um, as Lynn had said, I, I also worked with the Theater District Associates, the group that um, brought the other theaters, that brought the, the um, theater, on, built the theater on the square as a home for the Tacoma Actors Guild, and brought the, the um, Rialto into the, in, to, make, to make a real theater district for us. Um, all along the way, it was, not, it was not just Virginia, it was not just Josephine, by, certainly it was not just me. But it was uh, hundreds and hundreds of volunteers and donors and foundations and poli well-placed politicians who brought this together. The theater district associates, the ones who built the rest of the, found the, uh, the um, theater district, said, OK, we've got buildings here now, but we got to do more. we got to fill the streets. So the, the mask project that, that Lynn talked about, that Phyllis had a big hand in, uh, was a sign that this community, the community owns this neighborhood. The theaters are there, but all, all around it are, belongs to all of us. And we also, on the theater district task force, wanted to activate the streets. One of the projects that we took on was we, we um, inherited First Night, the first, um, the first, uh, uh, first night, the first New Year's celebration west of the Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Well, not only the first, the biggest. And the biggest in Washington State. First Night brings, brought, and, and will if it happens again, people from Vancouver, people from Portland, people from all over the state. Um, partying in downtown Tacoma until midnight, and we would wind up being at the store till 2 a.m., but that's, that's another story. That's another story. Um, one, of the, one of the great benefits of First Night, I will tell you, again, grassroots, working from the community to celebrate the community. One of the great benefits, one of the great gifts I had was being able to be up close watching Lynn Danino create some incredible, um, what was the word? Not only amazing, but notorious <laughs> presentations, like her Rolling Heads program. And project, the toaster. And the, and the giant toaster. The giant it, was, toaster. It, was, it was wonderful. Um, this, is, this is all to say that the idea of the Pantages initially was this is where the community got to strut its stuff. This is where the community got to, got to see great acts and great great performances, and this belonged to the community. And we wanted to make it stay that way. Donors gave money. When the Tacoma Actors Guild was formed, donors gave money to build the theater on the square, but they wanted that theater to be in the portfolio of the city to be run by a nonprofit in that of, this, of the city's cho choosing. And for that reason, donors opened their wallets and helped all that happen. That's in the past. Now there's some, um, do, so so. But it, it's easy for us to get lost in the history. So yeah. so we, we're we're watching the time as as we speak. But the no the. So the theater district has grown out of grassroots community support. It's grown from community donations. It's been a model across the country for, for how to revitalize dying downtowns by revitalizing old theaters. And periodically, as is best practices and as should be done, the management contracts are renewed. Occasionally, requests for proposals are put out to see what else is out there, because clearly, this all needs to be done with so much public money needs to be done in the most effective and, and best way. Um, sometimes the city has negotiated directly with the holder of the management agreement, whether that was Bro Pantages Center, or Broadway Center, Tacoma Arts Live. And sometimes they'll send out, um, sometimes they will send out further ranging RFPs. A request for proposals. A request, request for proposals. Um, the last one that was issued about 11 years ago brought in two local op, uh, applicants, the Seattle Theater Group and the Broadway Center. Um, the Seattle Theater Group operates the Paramount and Moore Theaters in Seattle. 
and the Broadway Center was um, awarded the contract. Um, Tacoma Arts Live has competed for the management rights in the past, and they were complete. They were certainly prepared to do that again this time. With, I, I must say, with no sense of entitlement. Yeah. Nobody owns the theaters. We own the theaters. The city owns the theaters for our benefit, and never has the Pantages Center, Tacoma Arts, uh, Broadway Center, Tacoma Arts Alive, which is the same organization that just changed names over the years. Yeah. But never have they said, this is ours, nobody else gets to do this. This and has always been. I'd also like to point out that the documents we're talking about, if you go to the Tacoma Arts Live website, you can find there a copy of the letter that uh, David Fisher sent out to um, his donors and supporters, um, letting them know kind of how this all was unfolding from their point of view. And I also would like to say at this point, we have two points we'd like to make here. One being um, regarding Tacoma Arts Live. Again, we're speaking personally about this. The other being the concerns we have about turning this 43-year-old public-private partnership, not-profit management system over to a for-profit corporation. So. Did you say out of Los Angeles? Out of Los Angeles. Oh, you did oh, say out, out of Los Angeles. <laughs> yeah. Um, usually, these RFPs, usually, without getting too deep in the woods, these RFPs say, if you want, the, uh, if we want to hear what you will do with this or with our buildings, we want these things, this to happen for sure. We want you to take good care of the res the resident arts groups. That's the Philharmonic, the ballet, the nine groups. That have that constitute the, the um, that live in the in our theaters, so they get a special deal on on ticket on on rentals for the for the facilities. We want you to do that. We want you to raise money, a certain amount of money every, every year, in order to help um, keep up the buildings and perhaps um, make them better over time. Um, and there are other smaller, more specific stipulations, but basically it's the same idea. It's been the same idea all the way along. You get the chance to, to manage the theaters, but these are the things you gotta watch out for. Every year that that's come up, Broadway Center, Pantages Center, Tacoma Arts Live has said, this is how we will do it. Every year they've been given the opportunity to continue doing that. This year, there was a big change. This year, um, the, the RFP that was released, and again, you can see this on the um, Tacoma Arts Live website, if you like. Um, there was much less of a city obligation in managing the theaters. They were, they were res the city was responsible for much less, the organization that ran it, would be responsible for much more. Risk would be on the management team's part, no risk on the city's part. Also, um, there, were, there were other stipulations in there um, that, um, oh, that, that the Tacoma, at, Tacoma Arts Live was demoted in the RFP, saying you have to take care of these eight ROAs, resident arts groups, but somehow or other Tacoma Arts Live was left out of those who would get a special, special understanding. So that was ultimately, ultimately corrected. When the city council found out about it, right. they stepped in and they said, you gotta make that change, that's yeah. silly. Uh, but there were, a number of other th there were a number of other things that was stipulated in the request, uh, the RFP. And to the ex along with a line that says, you got to do these things. If you don't do what we stipulate here, you can't. You might as well throw away your application. We want no changes to this RFP. Uh, Tacoma Arts Live looked at this. They said, "We can't do this, and still do what we've been doing as an organization for the city. We can't. We have to stop away. Step away. Um, this is not an. Uh, this is not what a nonprofit organization can do anymore." Um, when they stepped away, it turns out that every nonprofit in the region stepped away. Seattle Art, Seattle yeah, Theater so they, Group, yeah. pardon? So they had only four-profit corporations they, they, only, they had three, three applications, 
all of them for-profit organizations, one from Iowa, one from I don't know where, and one of them from Los Angeles, a very large presenting organization that manages theaters around the country. Um, the staff, and this is one where I get have to be careful that Phyllis doesn't kick me or something. <laughs> the staff is the one who are the ones who are credited with creating the RFP. The staff are the ones that did not want to negotiate on any of the items. The staff don't seem to have names. They're just staff. Uh, and so the staff um, has chosen the Los Angeles operation to, um, to do the management. We have concerns. So uh, yeah, one of our concerns clearly is transparency uh, in this whole process. And again, documents are, are available. I believe there will be an, a brief article in the Sunday paper so about this. Can, so yeah. there are ways to get more details if you would like them. But we are concerned that this whole process has gotten to the point where um, a, comp a, a corporation has been selected, a, con a, a contract is being negotiated, and it will ultimately go before council. But at this point, with this community treasure, there has been no community input. Um, for those of you who Facebook, you might know Steph had a posting. Um, we generated a letter with, along with Bill Barthma. 250 people had signed it within 24 hours. We sent it to city council. We have had two personal emails from one council member and no other response. Nothing. Nothing. Which council person? Uh, Lillian Hunter. Lillian Hunter. And it was either a, it was either, yes, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It, are, it, but it, we did make it through the souvenir program without killing each other. We yeah, did. We yeah. did. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Lynn, in answer to your question, yeah. I, when I sent the emails, sent our letter and the list of 250 people and a cover letter to the council, I, I sent a note to each of the council members I knew. And to Lillian, I said, we are not advocating for or against mm -hmm. Tacoma Arts Live. That's not our issue. Our issue is this has been done in secret, and we're really concerned about what effect this will have about, uh, about the city and the community and stewardship of the buildings. And our request was, can we just slow down and take a closer look at an RFP that only brought forth three responses, none of them from the sort of management system that's had this that's grown this operation over 43 years. Can we just slow down and take a look? Um, my, hmm. my greatest concern here has to do with stewardship. I had mentioned when, when I talked about uh, the theater district, when I, thought of, when I talked about the seven women with brooms, when I talked about the history of this, it all involved community access, community involvement, community making this place for the community, from the community. Um, one of the keystones that I know has been practiced all along by, by the various entities that um, started out as a Pantage Center, one of them was stewardship of the building. Not just making sure that the banisters were clean and the, the, the floors were vacuumed, but what do we? Let's set aside money to, to take care of this, and this is going not going to last for very long. And we need to invest in that. We need to. Bethel Schneebeck had us re uh, had a fundraiser to recondition an old uh, uh, Steinway grand piano. Uh, all of these things were additions to us, that with the intention, part of the stewardship, part of taking care of a the building, but more than that, trying to improve the building. I think you see right here, this is a restored Pantages that as it, as it appeared three years ago. Um, Tacoma Arts Live, with many partners, raised $22 million to totally renovate that, that building, to make it look better than it ever had ever before. That's the kind of stewardship that I'm concerned that we may lose. Uh, I, do, I can tell you that um, some of the major donors, the people who brought us the Rialto, the, 
who brought us Rialto, Karen, and when the, the Rialto was opened, the Tacoma Youth Symphony yeah. went from two, two orchestras to seven, mm -hmm. because this was ours, this was wonderful, and all these additional kids. It was a place for them to go. It was a place for them to go. We have now, I think, thanks to both to the facilities there and the the management of the of Broadway Center and and Tacoma Arts Live, if not the largest, one of the largest and most diverse arts education programs in the country in the state. Yeah, yeah. It's and it started out with Missoula Children's Theater because I used to sell those tickets. So. <laughs> so, so my concern, my concern. I have no idea what, what this for-profit Los Angeles organization is going to do. Don't know who they are. I know just by reputation what they are, but I cannot see the concern that has been shown over the last 43 years by an outside for-profit corporation. They got to make money for somebody. The nonprofits here have to make money to stay alive, but the rest of the money gets put back into the community. I'm concerned about that happening. I'm concerned about 43 years mm -hmm. of volunteer efforts, 43 years of donor, donor development, 43 years of, of stewardship being not just gone, but being thrown away by the staff who decided that this was the RFP that was going to go forward. Um, my hope is that enough people contact our city council to say, hold up on this. There needs to be a public process if you're going to take such a, a, a drastic step. I'm a voter here. I can care about what's happening here. Stop the process now. Let's have a community discussion about this before we go ahead and throw away 43 years. And take a look at what some of those unintended consequences might be while there's still an opportunity to do something different. Right. Um, that contract hasn't been awarded? It has, they are negotiating with that company right now. It's likely, according to Matt Griskell's article that will be in Sunday's paper, that contract will go in front of the city council at the, on the 31st of this month. Oh, so there isn't much time to convince the council, um, but I'm hoping that they will listen, and I hope they're not listening to me, but I think they listen to the rest of the voters. Maybe they will. Yes, ma'am. Staff, staff, you mean the council? No, I'm, I mean city, city staff. City staff. Which is, who knows? Yes. I don't understand how they wrote that to exclude the Tacoma Arts Live from the LSD. Well, it didn't exclude them. Let's be careful what we're saying. Yeah. It, it's an RFP, it's a request for proposal. Anybody, you can put in a request for yeah. proposal, mm -hmm. okay? But that organization looked at what they could do and what the requirements of the proposal were, and the requirements changed. So the question of who wrote the RFP and why did it change? I mean, that's looking at what's the root cause here. Why exactly. Does, why does none of those nonprofits step forward? Is because they recognize that they can't do it. Mm -hmm. So it's not it's not shutting them. But why did it change? Did money change? Did the budget change? I mean, I think that's the question: is why did the RFP right. itself change to the point that no nonprofit stepped forward? That's really my question. Yes, and yep. and we agree, and we don't know. We we don't know. Again, we 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 know what we're afraid of. We know some of what's happened, but we don't know what's happened um, at city desks behind city walls. And I, I understand there's been some sort of a non-disclosure. Uh, uh, yeah, there was some discussion at a city council yeah. meeting. Um, one of the staff members was surprised that the council would know about that particular item. And then they instituted a non-disclosure uh, agreement with all the people who were doing the negotiating and the choosing. Yeah. So that the yeah. council should have another, please? Yeah. Can you talk right into the mic? Sure. Um, can you say that in English for me, Phyllis? <laughs> so, the was so, uh, was so that they couldn't discuss what? The what, council, what were they not allowed to discuss? The, the council, it, it is part of, 
Yes. Oh. It, is part, it is part of the documentation on the Tacoma Arts Live. The details are on, a, on the letter Tacoma Arts Live sent out to its patrons when they announced that they would not be able to apply for this. And, and that is on their website. And that so is on can, the website. Yeah. But they, um, the, the question was. So. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. At, um, at some point in the process, um, when council was asking questions of city staff, apparently, and again, you know, uh, well, uh, apparently, a city staff was surprised that council would be asking questions and wanting to know what's going on. And they literally instituted a non-disclosure um, ag agreement um, so that people involved in the negotiation could not discuss details outside of their own tight circle. So, so there's, so, so we can't get information. So it sounded like. <laughs> In Los Angeles. Yep. In Los Angeles. That's yeah. correct. Yeah. 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 And I, I, I would not suggest that there was anything underhanded here. I would, I would, I, seriously, I, but I would suggest that with such a monumental change going on in our arts community, for the person who may well have generated this to be gone, once again, Who's going to be watching the ship? And I think in addition to that, such a monumental change in a time when we are all of us, every one of us, still impacted by COVID. Do we wear a mask? Do we not? Can we gather? Can we not gather? Arts organizations, like everybody else, have are 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 in chaos. It's not a time, I don't think, to make this kind of a change, and certainly not a time to make this change unexamined. I have a question. Why this year? How did this one person, well, we don't know if it's one person, but we yeah. have the same name, so exactly. I mean, the staff. I'm yeah. asking yeah. the staff, and uh, let me finish, please. Thank you. Um, how, how did this big, dramatic change occur? Why did things continue, Steph? Well, it was, uh, Alexa, it's, it's part of a regular, I mean, periodically the, RF, the management contract is reviewed. I mean, it's something that happens. I don't know what the timetable is, but it is something that happens on a regular basis. Um, this has been in the works for some time. I'm looking for my copy of David's letter and not finding it. Um, but, if you, but, he, but he talks about that in a letter on the Tacoma Arts Live website that you can look at. Um, I, I, think your, I think your question, Alexis, yeah. is why now do they make such a major yeah. change? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have no idea. Yeah. Uh, it makes no sense. Yeah, it was actually, that was, that was, Phyllis wrote a letter to the editor three weeks ago. Yeah, three weeks a month ago. And both decrying this, and it ended with what, what is it? For yeah, what throwing reason? it away for what? For what? For what? So. Can can William Hunter um, explain anything since she's the only one? I'm going to go out on a limb here and say something that I maybe shouldn't say. But one of the things that Lillian responded to us was that it's her understanding that the resident arts organizations are thrilled with a change in management. And I can only say, again, I say this personally, just I find that, of course, there's going to be tensions and frictions. I can't imagine scheduling all the performances, all the logistics, all of that. Of course, there's going to be issues there. But I find it very difficult to believe that suddenly this organization that's been at the helm 
How, how long has it, David, been a director there? Years. Anyway, for, for, seven, for a long years. time. Um, ha, has done such an abysmal job that the, comp, that the resident arts organizations are all happy to see them go. I, I find that very hard to believe. There is, there is a narrative going around the city offices that says just that, 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 they have ru that Tacoma Arts Live has ruined the buildings, has ruined the whole culture, they've ruined all the, the, all the resident arts groups. Um, and as evidence, there is a letter, an unsigned letter. We understand, right? There is an unsigned uh, okay. letter that says all of the arts groups are only praying for the day and sacrificing chickens for the day that uh, these horrible people are gone. I think that might be a little bit embellished. Okay, but. it was pigeons. <laughs> yeah. Was pigeons. Um, At any rate, but there let, are, let yeah. me just finish that. This morning, Phyllis had a call from somebody from one of the resident arts groups who expressed just dismay and unhappiness and was totally surprised that there was such a letter because they never saw, saw it, they never signed it, they never would have signed it. Yeah. Something's going on. So one of the things that did take place, I think, was that the Nutcracker, which is the fundraiser for the ballet, got repositioned sometimes because mm -hmm. Crystal Tom, of course, is hot time for major uh, productions to come. And I think they got uh, sidetracked a little bit and then they, so they moved to Fiddler Way, I think. Mm -hmm. And so if that started the thing going, maybe, you know, you say one event takes place, and then, oh, I think that another one could take place. And then I, I wonder if that was the start of all this. Well, we, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. We don't. Uh, the, what we do know. This, the Pantages <laughs> brought us together. This may take us apart. <laughs> um, the Pantage, the, um, the, the Ballet Tacoma has uh, the Nutcracker that they, that they perform for, I think, four performances during, during the middle of December. During the, that month, they have their stage up, they do some rehearsals, but the theater is, the Pantages is closed for those two weeks, close to other uses. Three years ago, I think it was, David Fisher running the Tacoma Arts Live said, all these other groups have a chance to make money in December. We can't just block out time and not let other people use it. So he said, we'll take care of your sets, we'll move them, we'll make sure nobody touches them, but during that time, other people should have the chance to use it. Ballet Tacoma was incensed by that did move up to, to Federal Way for one year to try that theater out, came back the next year, and everything was great, maybe. But that, that's my, that's a story I tell myself. So what are we going to do? Give, give us a paint by the numbers, Carol. What do you want us to do? We want letters to city council, yep. because what we would like to see, again, we're. We're not, we're not advocating a, a, for Tacoma Arts Live. Uh, we're, we're not trying to point a finger in any particular place, but we would like to see this slowed down. We'd like to see more transparency here. If there are, if there are issues, perhaps they can be sorted out. At this point, I think the only place that will happen is if city council when they see the contract, puts, puts the brakes on. And at this point, we don't see any indication that that might happen. Letters from the community should have an impact. Our letter with 200 signatures wasn't enough. We need more people saying, we just want to know what's going on. And I guess I would like to see it, um, and maybe this is the, the, my own naivete, I would like to see it unfold um, in a way where there can be open and honest conversation about what the goals of the city are, what the community's desires are. I really do not want to see it become some kind of battle of arts organizations. I think that that is a, 
that's not the healthy way to go about this. We need to find the best way to maintain those theaters, to maintain the theater district as it is. It's a living, breathing thing. It's not just another contract for who's going to provide the toilet paper or who's going to provide the beer. It, anyway, so. Do you know how long the contract is for? I don't know the, uh, I don't know the length of this, this, um, of this one. And that's probably, very likely that's being negotiated right now. Oh. Yeah. Um, it, historically, how long actually been? Five years to a decade, okay. somewhere in there. The, the last so one was. David stepped absolutely away and said, I'm out of here, I'm not, I don't want to go into negotiations. David's, oh, oh okay. <laughs> okay, here's another one of those. So I'll, so go for it, I'll okay. jab you okay. If, okay. I, if I feel oh, the need. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, when, they, when Tacoma Arts Live saw the RFP, when they went over it with their financial people, when they went over it with their attorney, they said, we, can't, we cannot apply for this. Um, there was a lot of back and forth about it. Finally, their board said, um, th finally their board said, we've wasted enough time. The city is not budging on anything. Just, just pull, it, pull away, we're done. Now, the the I don't know the name of that gentleman, yeah. but I do know that there did come a po point when Mayor Woodards and Councilmember Ushka uh, asked the staff to send a, to, they had arranged for a mediation between Tacoma Arts Live and the staff to, to see if they can make this work. And Councilmember Hunter was part of that also. That's what, she, yes. Yeah. And they said for mediation to see if this would work. The letter that came to Tacoma Arts Live did not say we invite you to come back and see if we can negotiate, see if we can make, through mediation, make something work. It said we would like you, we would like you to meet with us for healing. Yeah, for healing. For healing. For healing. At which Tacoma point... Tacoma Arts Live was there to negotiate a professional management contract. They were not there to talk about healing. Which was not the directive of the mayor and several council members, but it is how it was translated to Tacoma Arts Live. And it may have been at that point they said, that's it. And I think that, I, I do think that they are, I would like to think that if an opportunity arose, they would be back, Tacoma Arts Live would be back at the table. But I think at this point they are, David and, the, and, and his staff and his board are just exhausted because this has been a really difficult process that's been going on for a long time. And I think that it's not a great way to reward the kind of effort that that or, and stewardship that that organization has shown over the years, anyway, so you can jab me. Uh, have I exhausted you? So in summary, you'd like us to write to the city council? Yeah. Yes. We would. Yes, we are. Isn't that the best thing ever? <laughs> yeah. Yes, we are yeah. meeting by Zoom. Um, letters to the mayor, letters to the council uh, would help. Letters to the editor. Yeah, cannot hurt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, letters at, to the city staff. Yeah, they're the ones who made the decision. Is there a generic letter that can be sent out that we can copy and paste? Ah. I, I have not done that. Um, I'm wondering. I've done it for other things, so yeah. why not? Well, I, I'm wondering if it might not be better if each letter they got was a little bit different. Well, you can still yeah. personalize yeah. it, but yeah. I'm just saying that's a good. Yeah. It's, I've yeah. done it for other things. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. okay. Well, I will, I will post it on my Facebook page if you like, sure. Um, That'd be great, thank you, Karen. You're welcome. Um, I, I don't know anything, if you, if you have pictures of a council member doing something inappropriate, <laughs> you could tell them about that. Um, if you have friends who are concerned about the, the, the nature of our theater district, ask them to write the council as well, call the council, there is a phone number there is a phone number that you can also use for calling the council that's listed on the, on the city website. And you still sign up to, you know, if you go to a city council meeting, you know, there you can have 30 seconds. Is that still yeah. 
Yes. And they're open now. Yes. We just had their first live in person Ooh. town hall meeting oh. last Tuesday. Was it last okay. Tuesday, I think? Would be a uh, Tuesday. I, I, my question was do you want us all to show up on the 31st? Because we might. I think that would not hurt a bit. I think that would not hurt a bit. Yes. So it yeah. is part Zoom now. It's sort of half and half, I think, because mm -hmm. Lillian was on the television and so was one of the other council members, but then. So, so Lynn, you asked what I want, what I would like. I'd like people to get mad and let yeah. people know that you're mad. If you're mad. If you're not mad, it's okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, all the speakers. I think you guys know they're all volunteers, so they put together these uh, programs for you, and we appreciate them. Uh, so the next tripod is uh, Friday, September 17th. These are always the third Friday of the month. Uh, Beverly Nidas will focus on uh, her artwork, which is socially engaged art projects in the community. And then Tom Holt will be showing all the Tacoma murals. <laughs> so every time I drive by one, I write to him, here's another one, and they're all over the place. Uh, and, excuse me, and then Peter Altman will be doing a show about the Klimt paintings that were stolen from his family in Nazi Germany and uh, it took them seven years working through the courts to get those paintings back. And he'll come and show you some images and talk about that. So everybody, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Thank you.